Hello and welcome back to Bumblebee. I'm your host Teresa and this video we'll be counting down the top 10 brutal empresses you didn't learn about. These women were rarely chosen by their people for the throne. They came to power mostly by default or by stealth. A king had no sons or an intelligent queen upsurped the powers of her useless husband. The first lady on our list is Julia Agrippina. You may remember her from one of my first videos on the channel. Top 10 mad queens in history that spoiled the throne. She's remembered as the sister of the savage emperor Caligula and the mother of the later emperor Nero, but also as the empress of poison. She extinguished the flame of many men, including both her first husbands. The first was simply out of irritation, but the second husband she poisoned so that she could marry her uncle, Emperor Claudius. After marrying her uncle, Agrippina convinces him to adopt her son Nero from her first poisoned husband, and thus make him the official successor. Claudius did it, and once he had it was like sand through the hourglass, his time was soon to be up. Agrippina poisons Claudius in response to his inability to keep it in his tunic. Not interested in jealous adversaries competing for her attention, Greg Rupina pulled her classic move and just killed her husband. Nero came to the throne as a teenager, but for the years leading up, Agrippina was the empress and ruled in Nero's name. Once he was of age, Agrippina had a difficult time letting go of the reins, and takes it a little too far by constantly second guessing her son's decisions or making him look unexperienced, aka she bugged his ego in that mom kind of way. Nero banished her and after several attempts to end her life, he finally, finally succeeded in 59. AD. A story of lust is that of Empress Zeo Feiyan. Her origins may be humble, but Empress Feiyan is known in history for being so wanton that she had been the main protagonist in many lewd Chinese pieces of literature. Apparently, the reason the ancient chronicler Li Xiang began to compose his classic biographies of exemplary women's book is to remind emperors to choose a virtuous empress. Shockingly beautiful, she was called the flying swallow, meaning Feiyan, because of her ability to dance elegantly like a bird. In in 18 BCE, she captures the attention of Emperor Chang, the ruling Han Dynasty, while acting as a server. Chang became enticed by her. He turned Feiyan into one of his concubines with her sister, Hede. Feiyan, wanting to climb the ranks, accuses the favored consort of witchcraft and has her exiled. Once she's out of the way, Feiyan said the same lie about the Empress Zhu. Chang wasn't very happy in his relationship with the Empress, so while he knew the charges against the Empress were false, he used it as an excuse to just have her demoted. With the Empress position vacant, he decided to to make Feiyan his empress. During this time, Empress Feiyan and her second lady, sister Hede, killed any offspring of the emperor to keep their position secure. This is because Feiyan went to extreme measures to try and get pregnant, was but was unable. As a result, the emperor never had an heir. He passed away in 7 BCE, and Feiyan's sister Hede is forced to take her own life out of the suspicions she'd somehow caused his death, which by the way was a stroke. She remains empress alongside the new emperor Ai, and when he passes, a child ascends to the throne, and the Wang family uses the opportunity opportunity to strip Feiyan of her title and send her to the North Palace for deposed empresses. It's here, sisterless and her husband and title gone, she takes her own life. Our next brutal babe is Empress Dowager Sichi. She's one of China's most famous empresses for her ruthless personality and resilience. Born into a distinguished family of Manchu lineages, she arrived as a concubine to the Emperor Ziafeng in the Forbidden City in 1851. She quickly became pregnant with a son and paired with her analytical mind, she becomes the emperor's favorite. He discussed political matters with her and she became well informed of the status and liabilities of the state, gradually growing more powerful. So when the emperor died, Zichi did everything she could to gain political power. First by ordering the emperor's regents take their own lives and that her son, Tongzi, be crowned emperor. Seeing as he was a child, she governed the state during his reign and then during that of her nephew's reign. When he was put on the throne, she ordered him to be put into the reclusion of the palace within the forbidden city, isolating him from the world. Her own interests, schemes and revenge always came before matters of the nation, yet this was effective. She ruled the Chinese government for an impressive 47 years. Even if she's also remembered for squandering money on luxurious banquets where she would request 150 dishes each time. She was always seen drinking from jade cups and using solid gold chopsticks. At the end of her life, she still held grudges for her locked away nephew, Guangzhou. She killed him through arsenic poisoning and then she herself died one day later. Empress Lu Tzu set the standard for victim blaming, but she is also the first empress to China, so girl boss moment I guess. She's wife to Emperor Liu Bang who founded the Han Dynasty. Without her, the Han Dynasty would have struggled to establish itself, but it was her intelligence that was a crucial role in centralizing her husband's rule. Part of it was also her cruelty. She was persistent in gaining and keeping power and had several aristocratic families wiped out so she and the Emperor would maintain authority without any concerns. The Empress keeps her rage and tactile cruelty aimed outside the palace while the Emperor is alive, subjecting it towards prisoners and criminals. But once the Emperor died, the Empress famously turned 
turned on her deceased husband's concubines. His most favored named Kizi is memorialized in the story for meeting a brutal end. She had given birth to the emperor's son, Ru Yi, who would be next in line for the throne. The empress was not about that power change and made sure that the boy was dealt with permanently. Kizi was her hands and feet were chopped off and that should have been the end of it if anything, but the empress also had her eyes removed. Then she deafened the woman using needles and went so far as to force a noxious mixture down her throat that caused Gizi to become permanently neurologically damaged. The former concubine was then abandoned in a pigsty. Yeesh. Up until her dying day, the empress was known to make others suffer so that she could have all the power to herself. Up next, let's meet Empress Irene of Athens. She was born around the year 750 and there is little information about this early life, however, she was adopted into a family that had huge influence over politics. It's because of this that it seems Irene was destined to be involved in conspiracy, manipulation, and violence. Because her family's influence, she's married to the son of the Byzantine ruler Emperor Constantine. Leo picked her up from the bride show and they had a son together. When the emperor passed, the son Leo became the new emperor, making Irene the empress. Since their son was only nine, many conspirators sprung for a chance to dethrone him. Irene called for some backup, which included a number by Bayez's teen heir of special forces known as the Excubators, whose purpose was to protect them and banish or whip any who had no loyalty. But her son started to get power hungry with age. He wanted to have the throne and threw a literal tantrum to get it, ending with an open rebellion. While Irene was forgiving of her son at first, he kept trying again and again. He couldn't get the hint. After he ran away to the provinces and her army had to go retrieve him, no amount of begging at his mother's knees spared him any longer. Furious, Irene told her men to rip out his eyes. They actually did so in front of her, and he died. In her later years, after an uprising and now heirless, she moved away from the empire and became a wool spinner instead. Call that humble retirement. This daughter in law made the empress before her proud, Empress Wei. She was married to the emperor Zhang Zhang, who was the son of the renownedly merciless Empress Wu Zetian, who you'll learn more about later. It seems Wei tried to emulate her mother in law's evil ways to gain power and influence as she had. The couple did have a slight bump in the road when Xiang Zhang was exiled when his brother took the throne, but they reascended after 705. Now that Wu Zetian had died, the spiteful Wei was determined to get hold onto power. She began to interfere in state affairs. In order to get what she wanted, she manipulated and mobilized spies and supporters of Wu Zetian that she had gathered while in power. This is how Wei gains control of the entire court, her husband a mere puppet. She uses this power to kill all her enemies by framing them with ingenious plots and having them exiled or executed. While the emperor finally sees through his wife, she wastes no time poisoning him using his favorite food. That's cold. Eventually her plans failed in lieu of her inane puppet husband and her former sister-in-law jumped to power. Wei ended up being beheaded in 710. Now for the mama-in-law herself, Empress Wu. Of all these female rulers, none have aroused so much controversy or wielded such great power as the monarch whose real achievement and character remains obscured behind many layers of mystery. Wu Zetian was the first woman in 3,000 years of Chinese history to rule in her own right and technically the only. Since she entered the palace as an educator, rich young concubine who managed to obtain power. First as a favored consort to the ineffective Gaozong, emperor, then the power behind her young son's throne and as a monarch herself. She was ruthless and decisive and it's the reason she was able to stabilize and consolidate the Tang dynasty from straight collapsing. Since then, the Tang period is recognized as the golden age of Chinese civilization. She starts as a concubine serving Emperor Tiazong and then becomes a concubine to his, uh, his son, Li, when he took the throne. Okay, so she created creates a creepy lie to get the empress kicked out and locks in her role as empress by having a son. Then she poisons, supposedly, Emperor Li. Then her son dies of mysterious circumstances, you know what's up, and Wu finally took rule. Declared empress in 690 at the age 65, she's known for killing or locking up anyone that stood in her way. She had her own army of secret police to spy on her enemies and eliminate them. She starts some of the most horrific torture trends of ancient China as well. She eventually abdicated the throne to let her son rule, not long after she passed passed away at the age of 80. Now you can watch her story in the popular 2013 Chinese costume drama, Women of the Tang Dynasty, based on the era of Wu Zetian. This Biazetine baddie reminds us anything is possible, it's Empress Theodora, the Golden Queen. Depending on who you ask, Theodora was an X-rated Cinderella, a Machiavellian villain, or a feminist icon. But she was known to all of us as the wife of Emperor Justinian I of the Biazetine Empire. Born somewhere around 500 AD, nobody is certain of her origins. but. It is known her ethnicity was one of a deep tan
tan complexion with dark eyes and she was stunningly beautiful. She starts as an actress, however back in the day being an actress was often code word for adult entertainment. Our girl Theo was also taking part in some Mission Impossible style BS too, working as a spy for the provinces that surrounded Constantinople. Her next role was that of Empress. When she meets Justinian, Theodore has an art of seduction worthy effect and entranced the man. Even though the law said he couldn't marry her, he changed them so he was able to. Now Empress, she reigns brutal terror down on a and predators. She punished men who were harmful or ignored a woman's consent. If you were caught attacking a woman or even stood by and failed to stop an attack on a woman, then you could be executed. That and the victim would receive all the attacker's property afterwards. During the Nikiev revolt, a peasant uprising that was destroying the empire caused by Justinian's tax hikes and unrealistic expenditures, Theo refused to retreat nor let her husband do so. Instead, she made a rousing speech, urging her husband and his men to, well, nut up. In Theodora's words, it looks like it was up to a woman to give an example of courage to men. Never will I see the day when I am not saluted as empress, she says while Justinian begs to escape by sea. She then declared, purple makes a fine burial sheet. Justinian pulls up his pants since his wife isn't letting him go anywhere. She orders her men to herd 30,000 rebels back into the stadium where the riot began and mercilessly cut them down. It adds a lesson to all in the community. Along with her husband, she built up Constantinople with stunning churches and buildings, including the famous Hagia Sophia. She was also the reason that women received new rights, like the ability to own property and divorce no good husbands. You can be brutal to others, but what of oneself? Meet Empress Elizabeth. She is one of the most beautiful women who have ever lived, and it's exactly the way she wants to be remembered. And while bathing herself in olive oil or washing your hair with eggs and cognac may seem like a, some hack beauty strategies, they kept this 1880s Austrian Empress and Hungarian Queen at her best. Born into the Royal Bavarian House of Wittelsbach and the nicknamed Sissy, Elizabeth enjoyed an informal upbringing where her hands-on mother and father raised her to explore the countryside and enjoy creative musings. It's why when she's wed to Emperor Franz Joseph and thrust into formal Habsburg court life, she begins to descend into depression. The prospect of marriage had already had Elizabeth crying in the carriage on the way to the palace, mourning her freedom. She takes up acts of defiance such as smoking, a horse riding, and gymnastics. The slander she received for her hobbies, paired with those angrily lusting or bitterly jealous of her beauty, only contributed to her unhappiness. It's easy to see Sissy was in deep emotional pain, thus why she threw herself fully into the upkeeping of her beauty. She felt it's all she had to offer, all she had to maintain, and the only thing left to lose. She suffered from an eating disorder and severe depression as a result, and Elizabeth kept her weight at approximately 110 pounds and a 16 inch waist for the entirety of her life. Her overbearing mother-in-law and dull husband never cared. The sudden death of her infant daughter Sophie was followed by further tragedy with the loss of her only son Rudolf in a murder-suicide in 1889. Empress Elizabeth's tragic life ended in an equally tragic death after she was assassinated with a needle file in 1898. You can learn about her life in Netflix's movie The Empress. And last but not least is Empress Fredegunda. She is balls to the walls nuts. Her background is a mystery. We're pretty sure Frede was Frankish. Then when she was in her late teens, she was sold as a slave to the wife of the King Chilperic of the Susoyans. Now, she doesn't stay like that long though. She seduced the king and convinced him to ditch his wife, which he does. But he marries someone else and then Frede worked her magic again and the new wife showed up magically strangled in her sleep. The Emperor King marries Frede out of what I assume is self preservation, only took her a year and a half to go from a serf to the Empress Queen. Now that girl that she strangled was the sister of her own sister in law, who was a warrior baddie queen named Brunhilde. Naturally Frede and her new husband have a seven year war with his brother and Brunhilde, which they win and Frede made sure to execute the top government officials through systematically dis them joint by joint with white hot pokers and knives. With Brohende, who ran for the hills sort of out of the way, Frede continued her mad rampage to consolidate power for her, her husband, and their now newborn son. She circles back to her husband's exiled first wife and has her killed, then has some conspirators tortured on the rack with some crap talkers and she let wolves and lions eat their broken body. She then smoked out the clergy because they were stupid enough to voice their opinions on her violent lady behavior. Her favorite way to kill was via bands of thugs and poison douse blades. When her husband is assassinated, she flees to Paris and lives in the Notre Dame. For the most part, things were successful under her rule as she ruled solo for a decade, capturing several cities near Paris, allied with the powerful kingdom of Brundy. There's lots of other crazy stories of Frede, but I'll leave those for another time.
She eventually sorted everything out with her kids, handed the reins off to her son when he was old enough to be king, and then died peacefully in her bed in Paris in 597 AD. And so that is the end of our tale. I hope you all enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe to see more Bumblebee content, and comment down below what empress you would have feared the most.